Good morning, beloved. It's a privilege to be with you all today and bring you greetings from the saints at the Capitol Hill Baptist Church right there in Washington, D.C. We literally are five blocks from the U.S. Capitol, so it's uh, right there in ground zero for better or for worse. But I love being in, in Washington, D.C., in some ways the political center of the kingdom of man. It's great to be doing ministry with brothers and sisters uh, who love the gospel, who love the king of kings, uh, and serve him there. But one of my greatest joys as the executive director of Nine Marks, I've been serving in this role for 10 years, is to kind of to leave the, the CHBC Pentagon, so to speak, the Nine Marks Pentagon there in D.C. and come to the front lines and meet other brothers and sisters like-minded who love the Lord, who love the gospel, and who want to commit their lives together and individually to make much of Jesus, to make disciples through the way that they live their lives individually and corporately. And in some ways, that's the heart of my message today. Uh, I want to look with you all at the book of Ephesians and see, is there a biblical vision uh, for the church? And I want to start by way of introduction just with a simple question. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the church? Is your impression, your feeling positive or, or, or negative or indifferent or maybe a combination of all the others? What if you were to ask your friends or, or your co-workers, uh, your children if you have them, or, or your extended family, what, what would they say about her? How would they respond? Is the church beautiful in their eyes? Or is she barely even noticeable? Or worse, positively negative and horrible from the experiences that they've had? Growing up in Houston, Texas, born and raised there from 1975 to 93 until I moved to D.C. Uh, grew up in a non-Christian home. Uh, we went to the Unitarian Church, uh, which, felt w which fit well with kind of our conservative moral rationalism. We worked hard and got what we went through our reason. And honestly, growing up in Texas, sadly, many of the churches, like many of the marriages I saw, were, were not impressive. They were honestly better pictures of hell than heaven, in my mind. I thought Christians were, at best, hypocrites because... Uh, their lives looked no different than mine. I wanted to get into a university in D.C. and make a lot of money in international business, so I was more moral and hardworking in some ways than my Christian friends. And then sadly, uh, uh, you know, as I grew in, in my studies and my rationalism, uh, my, my attitude toward Christianity got worse. I, I started studying philosophy. I consider myself a rationalist. And as I was studying rationalism in, in high school and philosophy, every time I would look at the Houston Chronicle uh, headlines, whenever they talked about Houston Chronicles, our, our, our newspaper there in Houston, every time it talked about evangelical leaders or Southern Baptist leadership, sadly, it was usually with the words financial extortion or, or sexual immorality underneath it. And so I, I grew to disdain Christianity even more. I thought, okay, this isn't just hypo hip hypocrisy. This is, this is dangerous. This is delusional. This is destructive. So my twin brother and I, we, we got into that school we wanted to. We moved to Washington, D.C. in 1993 to go to college. And I actually started a philosophy club right there at Georgetown University. And, uh, and it was a quest for truth. And I was an evangelist before I was a Christian. I would lead people to atheism uh, because I thought I was doing good and guarding the truth and pulling people away from Christ and the Bible. And then in the severe mercies of God, though, at the age of 22, right after I graduated, I started attending a healthy church there, the one on Capitol Hill, and I was converted a year later. You see, uh, in, in, my, in the severe mercies of God, about 93, 94, right after I graduated from high school and moved to college, my dad had a mental breakdown because he went bankrupt, and it was a long story. It was like a movie. Bankruptcy, mental illness, and then there was adultery and then divorce, and my mom, uh, through the adultery and the during the divorce, moved to Washington, D.C., but in the severe mercies of God, she became a Christian, and she moved into a house on Capitol Hill. Uh, we were juniors in college now. Uh, she moved into a house on Capitol Hill, one block from the Capitol Hill Baptist Church, and the pastor, Mark Dever, had just gotten there a year ago, and my aunt led her to Christ and sent her to Capitol Hill Baptist, and that church kind of helped her walk through the divorce, and she was baptized there, and then my, my brother and I, we graduate a year later in May of 97, and at graduation day, my mom says, hey, next week is, I remember this one, it's graduation day. She says, next week's Mother's Day. For my Mother's Day gift, I want you to come to church with me. And we've always been a very close family. I thought, encourage mom, free Mother's Day gift, no brainer, let's go. So uh, on Mother's Day, 1997, I stepped into the Capitol Hill Baptist Church, and we actually kept going every Sunday uh, throughout the summer, because it was the one time we could be together as a family. We'd have lunch afterwards with mom. And two things struck me about that church. 
Number one, it was just weird. It was weird the way that they loved each other, the way that they loved my mom, the way that they loved me. I'd never seen that before, but it was weird in, a, in an attractive, compelling way. And then number two, uh, the pastor, Mark Dever, the preacher, the main preacher there, w- was weird. He was, he was like a false dichotomy in my rationalistic worldview, kind of like, like a unicorn in the sense that he was articulate, intelligent, had a, had, a, uh, had a PhD from Cambridge, but he was a Southern Baptist evangelical fundamentalist preacher. And in my worldview, those two didn't go together. Like, yeah, like a, a unicorn, an, an intelligent Southern Baptist, an articulate, you know, evangelical. And I started studying the Gospels with him, the Bible, uh, uh, that brother met with me every week for seven months. It was supposed to be six weeks. It turned into seven months because I had a lot of questions. And uh, basically, we studied the Bible and a lot of other stuff. But it was against the backdrop of that church, its corporate witness going on on Sundays, that the Lord converted me a year later in February 1998. And I became a Christian there at uh, Capitol Hill Baptist Church. And as I grew in the church, I started reading uh, my Bible, and I read verses like 1 Peter 2, 12, where it says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that was me. They, they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And then I read, I read, I read the Sermon on the Mountain, and I said, oh wait, that's just Peter echoing Jesus in his first public sermon, where Jesus says, y'all, you know, good Texan word, y'all, you all, that's plural in the Greek, right? You all, you be, be salt, be light, be, be distinct, be, be a city on the hill that they may see your good works and glorify my Father in heaven. I came to realize that the church was to be a display of God's glory, of his character, of his love, and his purity, and his unity. And by God's grace, I had been born again into a healthy church family. But also this church was his plan to make disciples, to fulfill that great commission. But here's the kicker. In God's mysterious providence, making disciples and teaching them everything that Jesus has commanded, it, it's not a quick process, is it? You know, I have five kids, ages now 9 to 20. I love being a father and a husband. It is, after knowing Jesus Christ, it is the greatest existential joy I have to, to be part of a family and have the privilege of, of leading my wife, Tara, and our five children. But often I'll look at my kids, including the 20-year-old who I love, love to death, talked to her for an hour yesterday, and I think, oh my goodness, do I have enough time in the 18 years that they're in my home to teach them just the bare, basic, sufficient wisdom they need to survive, much less less thrive and be prosperous, because they're like their dad, they're joyful bundles of iniquity, you know, and and, and raising children, it's a process, it's it's, it's glorious, it's joyful, but man, it's hard work, it takes time, and it's inefficient, and it's it's joyful, and it's hard, and it's 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 inefficient, it's just it's just a process that takes time and patience and much love, and did I mention how hard it can be, but at the end, if you are faithful, by God's grace, it can bear great gospel fruit. And I've come to realize whether it be pastoring at Capitol Hill Baptist Church or serving as a director at Nine Marks, working with literally churches all around the world, uh, whether it's raising, as a parent, raising my children, raising children, making disciples, it's a process that's glorious hard work, but God in his design has made both of those. Uh, The family is the primary means, the ecosystem by which this growth happens, but it just takes time. You see, beloved brothers and sisters, in this present evil age, life is war. Satan is warring for the souls of your children, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends. But we know the end of the story. God wins. Jesus will come back. He will bring in the new heaven and the new earth, and we will see him face to face. But until then, the gospel is going to be guarded and, and, and protected and, and put on display and guided through the church. So it is then, if that's true, the church is the most powerful weapon in the army of the Lamb to fulfill that great commission. There's no greater tool. If we can unlock the power of the church, we can truly have a supernatural power that will make disciples. Just think about it, right? The Word of God, right? I stand here with the Word of God. The Word of God goes out from the pulpit every Sunday into the church gathered, into the hearts and ears and minds of believers. And then y'all, you, get, you believers, you, you scatter into the world, into your neighborhoods, into your homes, into your workplaces. 
And, and you live that word out as, as salt and light and, and, and darkness. Oh, beloved, this is true power. And it's why a biblical vision of the church is so important. Unfortunately, like my testimony, this usually isn't most people's experience with the church. In America, among Christian evangelicalism, the local church is at best just assumed, but often forgotten as a central part of the Christian life, and honestly, for good reason. So for instance, college students go to college and they can honestly find better ways to minister and be fed in a parachurch ministry than they can a local church. And then those college students graduate from college and they, they get a job. They're not necessarily thinking about the importance of the local church, so they find a job where, and they live there, and then they get busy. There's really no good church around anyway. So uh, at best, their faith grows weak, if not just disappears all together. But beloved, the Bible, from its first pages to its last, but as, and especially the New Testament, paints a very different picture of the church and the experience that we're supposed to have in it. In Paul's letter to Ephesians, we see an astounding portrait of God's new society, that is the church, living together and fulfilling God's purposes as non-believers are converted, as believers are built up, and God is glorified through the communion of our life together in this new society that he creates through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the picture of Ephesians. And so as your guest preacher today, I just want to do two things. I want to encourage you with a biblical vision of the church. And then number two, for application and conclusion, I want to highlight just the blessings that come when we embrace this vision in our own discipleship. So to that end, we're going to go to Paul's letter to the Ephesians to capture God's picture, God's vision of the church. We're going to see five things that he does to create this new society. We'll see the, the foundation uh, in chapter one, which is the gospel. And then chapter two, he constructs it. Uh, and then chapter three, we see the purpose of all this. And then four, we'll see the, the results. And finally, we'll conclude with the power that drives this new society. That's our outline. Then we'll have four practical blessings uh, that come uh, when we individually commit to a local church. So that's the outline. Now, friends, my goal is that this is actually truly an expositional overview of the book of Ephesians. But we're not, it's not your typical expositional sermon where we're going to do a small passage. We're going to try to look at the whole book of Ephesians. Now, I'm, I'm saying I want it to be expositional because I hope and pray that the main point of my sermon is the main point of the book of Ephesians. But it's going to be, if you think of this sermon as a house tour, this is a big house called Ephesians. We're going to be running down the hallways, kind of knocking open a bunch of doors, speaking our heads in. But this is not the room-by-room room tour. Let me encourage you to do that later. You can go out, you can go this week, and you can read this whole book aloud in 20 minutes. So let me encourage you to take this vision that you hear today and go back in your quiet times, your devotional this week or with your family, and read sections out loud and do the more kind of room-by-room room tour. So with that, let's get started. You can open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. If you have them or turn them on, scroll to chapter 1, and we're going to start by reading uh, Ephesians 1, and I'm going to read the first 10 verses. And here we want to see the gospel foundation upon which God builds his new society. So let's go there now. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Beloved Ephesians is a beautiful picture of reconciliation. Vertically, Christ reconciles all of creation to himself and then to God. And then horizontally, Christ reconciles all believers, Jew and Gentile, to one another through the church. The power driving this reconciliation is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. That's what we see here in these opening verses. Paul gives us the foundation for our hope, the foundation for this new society. It's the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, that, that forgiveness of sins, that redemption through his blood. 
And you notice the fruit of this gospel for us there in verses 11 through 14, following right after. Read along with me if you have your Bibles. Paul writes in verse 11, chapter 1, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. My friends, the gospel is our only hope. It is the singular mark that defines the true church and the true Christian, or the lack of it is the false Christian or the false church. It's the one non-negotiable of all the marks that anyone talks about, whether there's nine of them or more. Why? Why is the gospel the one non-negotiable? Why is it the foundation? Well, because God always creates. God always saves through his word, right? So in Genesis 1, what, what does God do? He speaks and all of creation comes into being. And then in John 1, that word becomes flesh and lives among us. The pattern of the Bible is simple. God always creates. God always saves through his word. My friends, this is the gospel, and it's why it's essential. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other way to have a biblical church. It's a supernatural community of redeemed sinners living together for God's glory, and it's foundational, therefore, to his new society. What is that gospel? It's a simple message. I'm sure you've heard it. It's that great truth that God is a holy and just creator, but sadly, we have rebelled against him. In his love and in his justice and in his mercy, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the penalty that we deserve. So that means condemned, Jesus stood in our place. That means though he had no sin, he became sin for us, that we might become righteous and declared not guilty in God's sight. And this gift of undeserving grace and mercy, the kindness of God, it is offered to everyone who will repent of their sins and believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You see, Jesus meets us at the intersection of darkness and light, and he invites us into the family of God, into the church to adopt us as his children if we follow him. And this gospel of reconciliation is foundational for everything that Paul says and does. And it's why Jesus and the church are central to this gospel foundation. We see that at the very end of chapter 1. Look at verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet, that's Christ, and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So God gives Jesus in the gospel, verse 22, to build the church. Verse 23, to be his body, the fullness of God. So do you see that connection between the church and the gospel, right? The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins, and we have genuine, joy-filled fellowship with God and with one another if we repent of our sins and believe in Jesus. Isn't this a beautiful picture of the church and the gospel and their connection? The church is a blood-bought Super, supernatural community that grounds us in real relationship with our Father in heaven and with one another. So in God's economy, the gospel alone serves as this foundation on which he built his new society, the church. And how does he do this? How does God build this new society? Well, he creates it himself. That's the construction of this new society. That's point two that we see in Ephesians 2. So he begins, the first supernatural creation is in us. That's Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Uh, we have a new identity in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it has nothing to do with our worth or our works. Let me just read verses 8 and 9 and 10 to capture this. Paul writes about the individual, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you catch that? Okay, and here's the connection. He creates us anew 
for his workmanship. Or what's, what is that workmanship? What is he, you know, he's a worker. He's like a woodworker. What's, what's he trying to create? Well, that's Ephesians 2, uh, 11 through the rest of the chapter. And it's the church. He goes on, he creates the individual Christian so he then can work through Christ to, and us to construct the church as a display of his glory and of his power. So those five kids I, I, I mentioned, the youngest, Mark, loves he calls them mighty machines, construction sites. D.C., for better or worse, is growing a lot, and there's a, there's a lot of construction sites going on. So one of the things we love to do is just walk around and just stare at these mighty machines, we call them, uh, as uh, these man-made construction sites. And it truly is impressive. You, you do see the image of God even in, in, in construction crews and construction sites. Well, well, what I'm about to read here in Ephesians 2 is kind of like a spiritual construction site, right? So as I read uh, Ephesians 2, 12, just kind of have this image in your mind of a, of a spiritual construction site as God does some amazing things as he tears down barriers of hostility and ends racism between the Jew and the Gentile and constructs this new and powerful house of peace, which he calls the church. But don't take my word for it. Take pause. Listen to these words. Ephesians 2, 12. Here it is. The church being constructed. Remember that you were at that time. It's verse 12. Remember that, at your t- at, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Wow. So that means that the gospel through the blood of Christ, verse 13, brings us into a new supernatural community of peace. It gives us a new identity and union with Christ and with one another. It makes us citizens, members of the household of God. And through Christ, the cornerstone, God constructs his new society, a building, a structure, a holy temple. Are you beginning to see, my friends, this picture that Paul is painting of the church? It is amazing. It's a supernatural, blood-bought, spiritual construction site of awesome power and wonder. So God lays the foundation. He constructs this new society, the church, the dwelling place of God, he calls it. And what's the purpose of this new society? Well, this takes us to our next point, the purpose, chapter 3. As we look at chapter 3, keep in mind this picture uh, of this important, of, of Ephesians 2, it's important context. So in, verse one through, in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 3, Paul gives a brief aside to lay out his credentials, his authority to say the things he does. And then he goes on to state the purpose of God's new society, right there in verse 10. So if there's one verse you want to highlight for this sermon, it's going to be verse 10. And it says that the world might know the multifaceted wisdom of God through the church. Let's look at that together. I want to read a little context, verse 8, 9, and 10. I'll start reading Ephesians 3, verse 8. <clears throat> To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light to everyone, for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Here it is, verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Okay, let's just pause and think about that phrase, through the church. Now, in my mind, that, that's an amazing phrase. That's the, that's the last thing I would, I would put there. You know, we like to play Mad Libs with my family, a little game where you, you fill in the blank. And if I were playing Mad Libs, okay, God's going to display his manifold wisdom through fill in the blank. You know, I would put something like creation. You know, so my wife, 18 years ago, we honeymooned in the Canadian Rockies. Yesterday, I had the privilege to go take a quick hike around Evergreen uh, there in a little Elk Meadow Trail. And I was reminded once again of how creation really is, genuinely, uh, God's glory on high-definition surround sound. 
That's awesome. And we know and to, to some degree, of course, God's glory displays his creation. But that's not what this verse says. It says here that fallen, sinful people like you and me, the church, would display his wisdom to the world. That's, that's amazing. And in some ways, I think this verse, verse 10, is the pinnacle or the centerpiece of this whole letter, that the church is going to display the glory of God, his wisdom to the world. And what's the goal of all that? Well, we see that in verse 20 and 21. Verse 21 is another great one to circle as kind of just a main biblical text for the biblical vision of the church. And it's to give glory to God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, and in the church throughout all generations. Listen to what Paul says. He says in Ephesians 20, 21, chapter 3, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Okay, here it is. This is the one you want to circle. Verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So do you see the significance of this? What is the church? Well, according to Paul, it's an outpost of heaven. It is the very dwelling place of God. So this means that we we're Christians. That means that the church of King Jesus uh, is, is, is like an embassy for us. We, as a church, are an embassy for the kingdom of God. That means we all individuals, not just your elders and pastors, we all are ambassadors representing King Jesus here on planet Earth. I love working in Washington, D.C. Most every country in the world has an embassy or a consulate there. There's great history Great architecture, great museums, even though they're closed right now. It's still a beautiful city. But like I said at the beginning, it's a very temporal city. Everything about that city focuses on the kingdom of man. Every day, because like I said, we're literally five blocks from the U.S. Capitol. I have the privilege of walking around Capitol Hill. I get to see the U.S. Capitol, the Supreme Court, the Library of Congress. And I am so thankful that I know members of my church who are working in all those buildings. But me personally, I'm even more thankful that I... As a pastor, had the privilege to walk into the one embassy in town, the church, whose kingdom will not fall, whose king is not marred by corruption or pride, whose economy will not falter, whose treasury will not default. Oh, brothers and sisters, we all serve this one king, immortal, invisible, God only wise. We might be wrong about a certain political candidate or a certain political uh, party, but we are not wrong about Jesus and his church. You see, healthy churches are the best domestic policy and foreign policy, so to speak, for any country out there. This is a vision of a church that comes from God. It's not my vision. It's not nine marks. It's not it's not, it, 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 it's God's plan. It's, it's his plan for our good and for his glory. And the result, what we see right there in chapter four, it results in disciples being made who walk in a manner that is worthy of God and his glory, that build up the body of Christ, uh, the church, in love. That's what we see in chapters four and five of Ephesians. I'll just cite a couple of verses. Uh, look at me at Ephesians four, verse one. Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Okay, that, what's that look like? Okay, we'll go to verse 15. Verse four, chapter 4, verse 15. Paul writes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part, each member, is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Chapter 5 reinforces this same idea. You can look right there. At verses 1 and 2 in chapter 5, Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So you see what God is doing here. Through the power of the gospel, God is constructing a new society to display his glory. Its foundation is not our works, but is, the, is Christ's work on the cross. But the result is good works in us. It's the good works of the body of Christ. That is evangelism, bringing non-Christians to Christ, and discipling, building up believers in Christ. It's the many one another commands that Paul preaches right here in these texts, verse 4 and 5, and, uh, and throughout his other letters, as well as Jesus consistently exhorting us to the one another's. And finally, you notice there, those are the results. What is the power that is driving all this, new, just driving all this work? Well, in Ephesians 6, particularly verse 10 and forward, we see that Paul ends 
where he began. The power of all this is God. It is his strength. It is the armor of God that powers us in this mission. So, okay, there it is. We've run through the house. There's the quick tour of Ephesians. And I hope from that you've seen a biblical vision of the church of God's new society. Uh, Its foundation and construction, uh, its purpose, its results, and its power. But so what? What does this mean for you? If if you're an individual Christian, what does this mean for us as as a church, as Grace Chapel? Well, chapters 4 and 5 gave us the heart of our application, which is to walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ by building one another up in love, for we are members of his body. And that Greek word for member literally just means, like in English, member, it means to be a part of something. That's where we get membership from. It's right there in the Bible. We are part, members of Christ's body. And all these commands from Paul and Jesus, they can only happen when we commit to living together as a family, as one body. So for Christians, at its simplest, here's the application, this means that you should covenant with a healthy church, a local church, for your, God, for your good and God's glory. And of course, that local church will be united to the church universal. It's like the Townsends, we're, we're Christians, and hopefully my unique individual family is united with other Christian families. All that will locally and universally give glory to God and complement one another. The main idea here is simple. This is that the local church is to be the hub, the center of your Christian discipleship. It's God's plan to bring him glory. You're his bride, but it's a you all. It's a y'all. It's a you plural. And so you need to think carefully about whether and how you should commit to a church for that community that can then be a light and wherever you're living to bring glory to God and honestly to bring you the joy of being part of a family. And I pray that it bring you encouragement both individually and corporately to see this amazing plan, how God is working to, and performing to bring himself glory and to bring us good. It really is incredible that he's using us, men like me, you know, former bartenders and, and just, yeah, my past. It's just amazing, the, the men and women he uses to bring himself glory. So let me just give you four biblical reasons why you need to be part of a local church as we conclude. These are the tangible benefits, the practical application of this biblical vision of the church, of covenanting together with a group of other believers in your area. And if you're already a member of the church, may this just encourage you, remind you of its importance in your life, and strengthen your own walk with Jesus. And if you're not a member, ask yourself the simple question, why not? Why haven't I joined? If you're a non-Christian, I pray that you see the supernatural beauty of the church and come to know God through its witness, just like I did. So here they are, four quick reasons to join a church. Number one, join a church for non-Christians. When Christians join a church and live faithfully according to God's word, they collectively help clarify to non-Christians what Christianity really looks like. So as Christians commanded to love and follow Jesus' example, we have the ability in our ministries to bring light into the darkness, uh, just like Jesus did when he embraced the world's hurt and sorrow. And this will encourage and serve fellow believers, but it will also be a wonderful light in the darkness uh, to the unbelieving world. So one implication here is that while unbelievers are always encouraged to come to church, and one of your best evangelistic methods is to invite your non-Christian friends to church. Bring non-Christians to church. It's wonderful. It should be welcoming. But to be a member of a church, you need to be a believer, be a part of Christ's body. And this will actually help evangelism. It makes clear who is a Christian and who is not. And it allows a clear light to shine in the darkness. And this will be attractive in the best and most biblical sense of that word. Again, that was my testimony. Second reason, join a church for Christians. Now, this will be the longest of the four points. There's kind of three little sub points under uh, how this benefits Christians. But reason number one, why it's beneficial for Christian, three blessings, is uh, join a church for accountability. So God never intended for his children to live as solo Christians. Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 13, read, Take care, brothers, sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You see, by joining a church, we're saying, I can't do this on my own. I can't figure this out. I need help. I remember my first Friday night as a Christian. Again, I was 23. I was bartending in Georgetown, living a very worldly, epicurean, uh, pleasure-centered life. And uh, I just repented of my sins. 
and made a profession of faith. And so I walk into Mark Dever's study on Friday night and I said, um, Mark, what do Christians do on Friday nights? I literally had no idea. I, I knew what I couldn't do, right? I can't keep living like I used to, but I had no idea what to do. So by God's grace, that, that, that church, that same church that, that brought me to Christ, walked alongside me and he showed me what, one brother, Aaron, started, we walked, he was in the study, uh, study that night, Aaron, took a walk around the block with me. We started meeting. He started discipling me. I joined a small group that week. Just the church poured into me. And just like that first weekend, that first Friday night, how I needed that church to figure out how to, you know, what Christians do, I, I still need that church 40, 23 years later, you know, for accountability. Uh, I need brothers and sisters in my life who know me and can be involved in, uh, in my life enough to be able to love me, you know, love me hard and hit me hard. Love me hard so they can hit me hard. That's what accountability is. But friends, you cannot be held accountable if people don't know who you are. You have to be involved in the lives of others for us to help you. So churches consist of Christians who are willing to hold one another accountable, to be involved in the lives of others, and if necessary, to discipline a fellow member uh, who, is, who, who doesn't respond, who doesn't repent of sins, with the hope that they will be restored in great love uh, to their uh, communion with Christ and their communion with the church. In this sense, the church acts like a spiritual assurance of salvation cooperative. Now, friends, accountability is not a silver bullet. There will always be sin in churches because there will always be sinners. And, we, and this is important. We should never overlook abuses of authority and of accountability. So Genesis 2 is one of the most beautiful pictures of the image of God. The author gives us authority to image him well in the way that we steward the creation. So good authority provides, protects, loves, and serves. Right? Think of the good the good spouse, or the good husband, the good parent, the good teacher, right? The good coach that everyone's team, you know, wants to be on his team, right? That, or her team. That good authority will bless those under it. They will, it provides, it protects, it loves, it serves. Good authority is one of the most beautiful pictures of God, of who his image is. And the church should be the most brilliant of brilliant images of good authority. But that, but sadly, in many marriages, in many families, in many homes, uh, in many churches, authority is abused. And it is the most heinous offense against God. Abuses of authority are the most heinous ascent, uh, sins against God because they lie about who God is. They lie about that image. They do not provide and protect and love and serve those under them. So, be, obviously, we cannot support abuses of authority, but good authority is why we need to be a part of a church so that, again, sin doesn't thrive in the light. First John 1 night, if, if, if First John 1 night, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the hope. So our goal and by being a part of a church, is a culture uh, where we can learn to give and receive godly encouragement, right? Don't flatter. The world flatters, but we learn to give and receive godly encouragement, right? Loving hard. And then we also learn to, to, to give godly constructive criticism. That's hitting hard. We don't gossip. We don't destroy destructive criticism. Again, that's what the world does, and that's what we will naturally do apart from the grace of God. But we want a culture of giving and receiving godly encouragement and constructiveness. That's why you want to join a church for that kind of accountability. But also join for the love, encouragement, and discipleship. And this is somewhat related, but stronger and weaker Christians need each other. Stronger and weaker Christians need each other. So Jason and I, my twin brother, were uh, in England in, in high school. Uh, it was fun. We did a little trip with, with international scouts. We were going out to this international scout camp in the country. And we were uh, driving along. And I'm from Texas, like I said. And I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, of, of cattle of uh, longhorns, but I'd never seen a sheep. So this whole flock of sheep kind of shows up in the middle of the road. So we had to stop our car because they were just kind of bumbling along. We couldn't drive. So we parked. We actually got out of the car, sat on the roof, and we were just watching teenagers goofing around. And uh, it was hilarious because I, I thought sheep were, were white. They're not. Sheep are, sheep are dirty, and they're, they're dumb, right? It was hilarious because I was an immature teenager. We were just laughing, throwing things at them, but it was, it was just wrong. But we were just laughing. These, these dumb sheep, they were, they were going the wrong way. You know, they were fall, literally falling into the ditch. One of them did. They were biting and nipping at each other. But what was interesting, about after 10 minutes or so, with the help of the shepherd and the sheepdog running around them, those dumb sheep stayed together in a flock, and they made it down the road, and they got into the, into the, into the sheep pen, and then we got in our car and kept on, on driving. But you see, friends, that's us. We are those dumb, dirty sheep. 
that bite one another. We're easily swayed off the path when we don't get something that we want. Uh, We fall into the ditch. We turn around and run the other way. But by God's grace, if we stick together with the help of the shepherds, we can bumble down the road and stay together and make it safely into the, the sheep pen all together. So what are you saying, Ryan? What am I saying? That you're better, that I'm better stuck in the middle of the flock, even if it slows us down in our own discipleship or inconveniences our lives now. And I promise you, it will inconvenience your life to be a part of a family. But why, friends? Well, because if you know your own heart well, you know that it's actually more dangerous to be alone or on the edge of the flock because we're prone to wonder. And where, where, do, the, where do the wolves live? The, li- the wolves hang out at the edge of the flock, right? They get the guys who are on the edge are the ones who are wandering alone. And it's true, joining a flock of believers in the church will probably slow you down and inconvenience your life. But have you considered the fact that maybe God wants to inconvenience you and slow you down so that you can then lock arms with the other sheep around you and help speed them up? Older men and women in the faith are commanded by Paul to disciple and encourage younger Christians, Titus 2. Younger Christians are called to care for and love older Christians. So we want to be a part of a church because it helps with accountability, with discipleship, encouragement, and love, and finally to share responsibility. Not a long point here, but 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is the most extensive teaching on the spiritual gifts. It's Paul's most extensive meditation on it. And you can here's here's the main lesson from 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. Your spiritual gift is whatever builds up and meets the needs of the church. No spiritual inventory required. It's great if you have experience and technical training and this is what you do, but your gift is what's going to be most helpful at that time to build up the church. So that's why we want to be a part of a church so that we can share responsibility, whether it be preaching the word or turning off the lights on the way out. So finally, join a church. As for conclusion here, join a church for church leaders. Let me give you just one example here. In Hebrews, leaders are commanded to keep an account of those who are put under their care. Hebrews 13, verse 17 writes, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Beloved, what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that on the final day of judgment, Scripture teaches that we pastors, we elders, we will hold the hands of the people who are entrusted into our care, our flock. And we will have to give an account for each of those souls in our flock. So very practically, how can a leader know who to lead and care for if the members do not come to church? Or if they come, but they're not, they're not formally agreeing to submit and say, I will submit to the formal care and authority of the church. It is a formidable and yet glorious calling. And it's exactly what our great shepherd himself, uh, how he cares for us. And it's why he appoints elders for every church so that they can gather and protect the flock, minister the word of God, and equip the saints for ministry. It's a great picture of God's kindness and wisdom. And yet it's another reason, a third reason, why you want to be part of a local church. And finally, to conclude, join a church, and this is my second conclusion, join a church for God. That's the fourth and final reason you want to join a church. It's interesting, if you look through the book of Acts, it is the Lord who adds people to their number, and being added to the Christian's number meant being identified in the church. So the most striking illustration of this connection between God and the church church takes place in Acts 9 when Saul is on the road to Damascus to persecute and kill Christians. And Jesus confronts Saul on the road to Damascus and he asks him, well, you remember what he asked him? He says, his first words to Saul, he says, so Saul falls off, his, falls off his horse and he's looking at Jesus. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you going to persecute those Christians? No, he doesn't say that. He says, does he say, Saul, Saul, why are you going to persecute the church? No, he doesn't say that. He says, Saul, Saul, why why are you going to persecute me? You see, beloved, Jesus so identified with the church that he called it me, him. And I think Paul, after he became converted from Saul, uh, that that, that, that image was, was in his first Christian conversation. And we see Paul actually writes about that in Acts 20, where he says, you know, the church is the body of Christ and that God bought the church with his own blood. Beloved, I'm your guest preacher. I'm I'm not one of your pastors. I don't know all the bits of your life and how you've been brought up in the church or how to regard it and what your experiences are. Maybe they've been more like mine early on, more like hell than heaven. 
And for that, I apologize. I hate that. But in the New Testament, I can tell you, the church is regarded as the body of Christ, bought with God's own blood. This is what God is about. So ultimately, we want to be a part of the church for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, this picture is a challenge and a comfort to see the responsibility we have is a challenge, but to see how we will be cared for and loved for and prayed for by God's family is such a great comfort. And so, Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for your bride. Grow our love for you and for her that our lives together may be a wonderful display of your glory to the watching dark world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.